Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Today I will continue the study of the book of Galatians, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. First, let me just say that... Uh, I tell you, to me, that's the prayer, the prayer of my life. Obviously, we can get specific and name all the ways we want Jesus to help us, but all the time we're in need in our lives because I, I've learned that I'll be 67 in a few days. And I'll tell you what, if I've learned anything in my life, I've learned that life is a series of problems to be solved. Um, it's um, it's like you're you're wading into the ocean, and there are some pretty strong waves. But when you go out ankle deep, um, it doesn't really affect you much. But if you dare to really get involved in life, and you go knee deep you're going to find that a wave will knock you down. And by the time you get back up and brace yourself, there's another wave. And that is life. The question is, do we get back up? And how do we deal with the constant waves pounding on us, the trials and tribulations of life. I had some issues today. I won't go into the detail of it, but it's just, just another example of each day has its own challenges. But rather than getting sidetracked, uh, I'll just say, uh, remember, just call on the Lord. Help me, Jesus. Help me, Jesus. Help me. Help me. All right. So Let's get started now. Galatians chapter 6, the last chapter of the book of Galatians. Verse 1, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so, fulfill the law of Christ. So, the law of Christ, of course, is to, to love your fellow man, love your neighbor. But it doesn't matter if the person lives right next door to you, or um, a block away, or in a different city, or a different country. Our fellow man is what Jesus is talking about. Uh, we should have a love for our fellow man. Now, let me read this, these two verses in the Amplified. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any sin, you who are spiritual, that is, you who are responsive to the guidance of the Spirit, responding to the guidance of the Spirit, I've talked a lot about that in the last video. We all have a choice. Did you put your faith in Jesus? Are, are you relying on Jesus Christ completely for your salvation? If you did that, then the Holy Spirit of God is living in you permanently. And the Holy Spirit wants to direct your paths, wants to transform your mind, your desires. And then, of course, that will change our actions. Um, but do we listen to the Spirit? Do we How do we respond to the Spirit? Do we resist it? And instead, uh, walk in the flesh uh, with our sin nature guiding our lives? Or do we feed the white dog and, let, and make the black dog starve? 
Let the sin nature starve because we're feeding the Holy Spirit with Bible studies, prayers, fellowship, minister, ministerial works. Uh, listen to the Holy Spirit. Respond to it. If anyone is caught in any sin, you who are spiritual, that is, you who are responsive to the guidance of the Spirit, you're spiritual if you're responsive to the Spirit. If you are aware that the Spirit is uh, not only in you, but wants to transform you, wants to guide you. Um, there's a, I think there's a verse in, it's in Proverbs. Uh, uh, Love the Lord with all your heart. And let him guide your paths. I think I'm combining two different verses there. Um, but let the Lord guide your path. Or I know the Lord will guide your path. Um, the Lord wants to guide your path. But will you fight him? Or will you submit and allow the Lord to guide your path? If you do that, if you're responsive to the Holy Spirit, then you're spiritual. Um, you who are responsive to the guidance of the Spirit are to restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness. A spirit of gentleness. Uh, KJV says meekness. The difference between meekness and gentleness is uh, gentleness, a person can be gentle uh, without necessarily being meek. Meek to, means that you have power, but you reserve it. You restrain it. You're, you're turning the other cheek when you know that you could just counterattack and destroy your enemy. But instead, in meekness, we restrain ourselves. Uh, so uh, gentleness is wonderful, but I believe that meekness is a, is a greater virtue. Uh, to, you are to restore such a person. Any, anybody in your fellowship who is caught up in some kind of a sin uh, uh, restore such a person in a spirit of gentleness, not with a sense of superiority or self-righteousness. No. We, we want them to know that, look, we are all struggling in our own ways with the flesh. But we do get the victory over the flesh if we are responsive to the Spirit. So this is the counsel we need to give the brother that it's uh, these verses are talking about. If anyone is caught in any sin, uh, if uh, in the KJV, if a man be ta overtaken in a fault, uh, rather than coming down on them, being very judgmental of, the, uh, of them, uh, we tell them, we instruct them. Uh, of course, I too struggle. And I found that the scriptures tell us if we will respond to the Holy Spirit, we get the victory over the flesh. That's the counsel. That's what they need to hear. That's the, those are the encouraging words they need to hear. And we tell them, not with a sense of superiority or self-righteousness, keeping a watchful eye on yourself so that you are not tempted as well. Yeah. Well, we're all tempted. Uh, but... Uh, um, I, I believe that the spiritual attacks that we are under, um, they eventually, uh, the enemy learns that they're wasting their time on you who are walking in the spirit because uh, their, their attacks are just like water over a duck's back. Those spiritual attacks don't do anything because we're walking in the spirit. So it, it, it could be that we could be caught up in sin ourselves. We have to guard against that. But the best answer is not dwelling on your sin and focusing on the sin and being uh, sin-minded. Uh, instead, be sun-minded. Focus on the sun. Think about the Son of God. Think about the promises. Uh, listen to the promptings of the Spirit. Allow the Holy Spirit to 
to renew your mind, to transform you. Carry on one another's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the requirements of the law of Christ, that is, the law of Christian love. Okay, verse 3 in the KJV, For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives, deceiveth himself. There's a lot of ways that people deceive themselves. So the verse that comes to mind is First John is, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Uh, it, it says here, if a man think himself to be something, if you're all puffed up with spiritual pride, when you are really nothing because your um, your works are only filthy rags in the sight of God, it's only the work Christ is doing through you, through the Holy Spirit working through you, that has any meaning or value. Uh, and so, and in that case, all the glory goes to God. God gets the glory. The, the, the five souls of the Reformation, one of them is sola gloria, all glory to God. We don't get to have any glory. We don't get to boast in ourselves at all. We don't get to have spiritual pride and be all, all puffed up. So when you're, you're really nothing, even the most spiritual person, the most advanced person in Christianity is nothing because we're still comparing you to Jesus. We all fall short of the glory of God. Jesus is the glory of God. He's perfection. So don't get puffed up with your and your self-righteousness. You're only deceiving yourself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Let me read verse 3 and 4 in the Amplified. For if anyone thinks he is something special, when in fact he is nothing special except in his own eyes, he deceives himself. But each one must carefully scrutinize his own work, examining his actions, attitudes, and behavior, and then he can have the personal satisfaction and inner joy of doing something commendable without comparing himself to another. Well, this is one of the favorite uh, techniques of the lost, of the people who've never put their faith in Jesus. Uh, if you ask them, uh, do you think you're going to go to heaven and why? Uh, by far, the most popular answer is, well, I think so because it's because I'm a pretty good person. They th think pretty highly of themselves. And that's because they're not comparing themselves to Jesus and realizing that they fall short. They're comparing themselves to other people. And in, in their mind, they... They think they're better than their neighbor. They're better than your your average person. They might not be the best person, or uh, they will maybe not go that far in their boasting. But at least they boast that they're a pretty good person, relatively speaking. But uh, the Bible says that no one is good. Only God is good. Uh, good is spelled G-O-O-D. God is spelled G-O-D. I believe it's the same word because the Bible says that only God is good. So God is good. God is good. Good is God. You're not good because you're not God. God, good in, in, this, um, um, in, in this application of the word, good doesn't mean relatively good, <clears throat> pretty good compared to most people. Good means... God, goodness, that's perfection. Godliness, goodness, that's perfection. Let's look at verse uh, 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Let 
Look at verse 6 in the Amplified. The one who is taught the word of God is to share all good things with his teacher, contributing to his spiritual and material support. Well, do you have a uh, a teacher? Uh, if you have a teacher, now it could be a pastor, it could be a Bible teacher, it could be a mentor, it could be a, a brother or sister who's more mature than you, who knows the scriptures better than you, has grown spiritually greater than you. Uh, it, this person says, you, sh you should be contributing to their spiritual and material support. You should do what you can to help them. And material support, I guess there's material means material things. Uh, uh, food, uh, shelter, uh, financial. Verse 7 in the KJV. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Well, let me see. December of 86, I got saved. So I've been saved for about 31 years now. And up until a year or so ago, when I did the, uh, uh, the verse by verse commentary teaching on uh, the book of Job, I, I realized that this reaping and sowing is not a law. I, I've always referred to it as, as the law of reaping and sowing. We see reaping and sowing mentioned by Jesus, and we see here twice now mentioned by Paul. Um, but I always consider it to be a law. You will reap what you sow. Uh, and yet, um, we know that there are some people that uh, they're not Christians, uh, they're not even good people, and yet they prosper. And we wonder why, why, Lord, why, why are these horrible people prospering? And then we, we look at people who, uh, they do all the right things. Um, spiritually, they are uh, attempting to grow and mature as a Christian. Uh, physically, they're trying to eat well, they exercise, they abstain from bad habits, and yet they end up getting sick. Some of them dying too, way too young. Uh, and yet we say, well, they didn't bring it on themselves. They got cancer, but they didn't smoke. Uh, they got liver disease, but they didn't drink. Uh, so sometimes um, bad things happen to good people. And this is one of the arguments that we hear from uh, the, uh, the atheists, the skeptics. Uh, they, they say, well, how can God let bad things happen to good people? Well, first of all, Really, no one is a good person, as I just mentioned earlier, uh, because we're only good in a relative sense comparing ourselves to other people. But we're not good uh, when compared to God. Only God is good. And yet, the people that we think, uh, they are certainly trying. Uh, they, uh, they're they're doing, trying to do everything right. And so they're sowing. They're really sowing by... Uh, they they don't skip school. They attend school. They study. 
they, they, they get advanced in their education. They work hard and they work their way up in their careers. They uh, eat well and they, they they're, they're do everything to have their health. And yet, they get hit by a drunk driver and a, a T-bone and they're killed. Uh, things like this happen. And we can't ignore that. So, um, did they reap what they sowed? Uh, I, I don't believe that God, of course, I, you know I'm not a Calvinist. I'm as anti-Calvinist as anybody you'll ever meet. Um, the idea of um, God's sovereignty uh, uh, versus uh, the free will of man in Calvinism, it makes me sick because they say man doesn't have any free will. God exercises his sovereignty and controls every thought, word, and deed that we do. Every sin we commit, even the most heinous, sickening sins that you can ever think of, God is controlling the person like a puppet, programming them like a robot, making them do those horrible things. Uh, pedophilia, uh, rape, uh, dis dismemberment, murders. I'm just trying to think of the most cannibalism. I'm trying to think of the most horrible things. And in, in Calvinism, they, the conclusion you have to come to is that God is making us do these things. So uh, the, the verse says, we are all without excuse. But with Calvinism, we do have an excuse. We could go before God at the judgment and say, I didn't have any choice. You controlled me like a puppet. You made me do these things. God, you're the guilty party. I'm, I was just a puppet that you used to sin. Uh, so in Calvinism, man is the innocent puppet and God is the author and instigator and practitioner of sin. So it may, absolutely makes me sick. But let me see if I can find the verse so I can remember why I was talking about that. Okay, so reaping and sowing. Um, no, uh, we we reap, we, we, we sow, and, but we don't necessarily reap what we, it seems we should be if, if you're truly reaping what you sowed. Um, now, generally, this is true. It's, it's a general rule. It's a, it's, a, it's a principle that we reap what we sow. Jesus said it. Paul said it. It's true. But it's not absolute. And it's, uh, uh, you look at Job, if you, read, if you go to my verse-by-verse -verse commentary I did on Job, Job is the most righteous man in the world, world according to God in the very first chapter, uh, and yet, uh, and Job did all these good good things, and bad things happened to him. Uh, Job did not reap what he sowed. Uh, eventually, in the end, he did, but there was a lot of suffering, and um, of course, Job is the greatest example, but you probably know people. You probably either know people personally, maybe you are one of these people. But you say, why God? I did everything right, why? I know I've said that to God. I've wondered, why me, Lord? Of course, the obvious answer really is, why not me? I know better than others. If bad things can happen to other people, why should I be any different? Uh, so reaping and sowing is a principle that's generally true, but it's not a law that's absolute. It's, sometimes it seems that the, the evil people prosper and the good people uh, suffer. When I say good people, of course, the, the relatively good people. Um, now, for he that soweth to his flesh shall reap the shall of the flesh reap corruption. 
Uh, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let me read that verse 8 in the Amplified. For the one who sows to his flesh his sinful capacity, his worldliness, his disgraceful impulses will reap from the flesh ruin and destruction. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Well, we, we receive eternal life uh, as a result of believing the promises of Jesus, believing that Jesus did does alone have the power over life and death, that Jesus did, in fact, pay for all my sins, that Jesus did promise that I will receive eternal life and heaven as a free gift if I will trust him completely. And so this is how we reap eternal life. We do not reap eternal life because of uh, the, the works that we do. Uh, but the one who sows to the Spirit, the only way that you can sow to the Spirit that results in eternal life is to um, ask, seek, and knock. Ask, what's the purpose of life? Why am I here? What happens after I die? These are the questions that I had in December of 1986, after the death of my mother. I needed answers. I was asking, and I was seeking. And fortunately, I was led to the Bible to find the answers. And the Bible is the source of truth. It's, it, everything has to be tested against what the Bible says. Uh, and uh, I knocked on the door. The door, uh, Jesus is the door. So I, uh, I was interested. And then the truth was revealed to me through the scriptures. Let's go to verse 9 in the KJV. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not, if we don't get worn out, that's what happened to my wife. She fainted. She fainted, passed out, hit her head. Fortunately, uh, after many, many tests, uh, she's been given a clean bill of health. But sometimes we faint. We've just overworked ourselves. We've overdone it. And then we, our, our body just faints out of exhaustion and uh, if you do faint though it says it says for in due season we shall reap if we do not faint in this case faint means just get tired and you give up verse 9 in the in the amplified says let us not grow weary or become discouraged in doing good for at the proper time we will reap if we do not give in. Verse 10, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men. Every opportunity you have, do good to your fellow man, especially unto them who are of the household of the faith. Uh, there's another verse that Paul, where Paul says that we should uh, prefer one another. We should prefer other believers. Um, there is a balance uh, because the Bible says that we need to be a light and you don't hide the light under a table. The light has to be on the table to shine so people can see the light. Uh, so. Uh, we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. We do not conform to the world. We're a light so people can learn about Jesus. And then uh, we, we set the example for them. We do not conform to the world's ways. Uh, but we're, so we got to be in the world in order to testify about Jesus. Uh, 
they can't get saved unless they hear the word. And they're not going to hear the word unless a, a preacher comes. So we need to be in the world, interacting, dealing with the lost, but our love and our heart and our, and our desire is to be with the brethren, all the people who have already put their faith in Jesus. Why? Because we have the, this one thing in common that's above everything else, and that is our faith in the Savior, Jesus. I, I, I much prefer to interact and, and um, be with believers, true believers, people who believe in the free gift salvation. And because we love to talk about Jesus. Uh, when you're in the world, obviously, we preach to them when we, when we can. But sometimes our friends or family and people we are interacting with, uh, they let it be known that they're not interested. They don't really want to talk about Jesus. They don't want to hear about Jesus. Well, maybe like a good fisherman, we don't try to impose the hook on them. We have to use some technique and give them a little line, give them a little slack. And then later on, we'll make the, make the lure jump in front of them, and maybe then they'll get be interested. I can't tell you how many friends and family I have who have put their faith in Jesus not immediately after I got saved, not because they thought I was just a Jesus freak. What's wrong with you? And, and you're out there in the street preaching on a street corner? You lost your mind? Uh, but five years later, 10 years later, 20 years later, the time is right for them. Now they have an interest. Maybe they've been knocked down on their knees through difficulties in their life. Like I got knocked down on my knees at the death of my mother when I was faced with mortality for the first time. For the first time, a close person to me, my own mother, died. And I needed answers. I was ready. I was interested. I was seeking the truth then. So when we're out there preaching and, and teaching, uh, we have to recognize that sometimes a person is not, does not want to hear it, but maybe next year they will, or five years. We're called fisher of, of men. I've done a lot of fishing. I don't know if you have. I fished in uh, rivers and lakes and uh, or oceans and uh, there's technique involved it's not just some crude uh, um, exercise where you, and you're just relying on luck there's there's uh, knowledge expertise technique skill involved and as fishers of men uh, fishing offering them the, the, the gospel and wanting to draw them to Christ, uh, there we have to recognize that, uh, yes, let's, let's see if we can reel them in immediately, but if, if they resist, there's always another day, unless we repulse them and, and push them away from Jesus because we're so overbearing. Uh, I, I've done a lot of preaching in the streets, and I know personally, at least 50 or 100 street preachers from all over the country. And I know them, I've worked with them, I've w watched them, I've listened to them, and some of them, the result is people say, if that's what a Christian is, I never want to be one. They're not drawing people to Christ. They're repelling them or repulsing them, pushing them away from Jesus. That experience happened to me when I was about 10 years old. I had a bad experience in a church when I was a little boy, and I resisted uh, the Bible and Christianity for much of my life because this particular pastor was so obnoxious. I just thought, I never want to be a Christian like him.
ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. Um, verse 11 in the Amplified. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. There's two footnotes here in the Amplified. B and C, let me see what they say. Paul frequently dictated his letters to his secretary, such as Tertius, that's Romans 16, uh, verse 22. In this case, however, he applied the ink himself. His reference to large letters has been variously interpreted. One, Paul may have been using large print for emphasis, or two, Paul may have been referring to some problems with his own vision. So maybe that's why Paul says, you see how large a letter I have written unto you with my own hand. Verse 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. In the Amplified, those who want to make a good impression in public before the Jews try to compel you to be circumcised. You see, the, the Judaizers, uh, I, I've said this over and over again, but the Judaizers, we have to trace it right back to Jerusalem. That's where all of this was coming from, the Jerusalem church. Uh, before uh, Christianity spread outside of Jerusalem and outside of Israel, it was right in Jerusalem in the beginning. And uh, James was the leader of the Jerusalem church. And James is the one that uh, told Peter, what in the world have you done? You preached to the Gentiles? You actually went into a Gentile's home? You ate with a Gentile? These things are forbidden. We Jews don't do that. You ate Gentile food? You broke the dietary laws? You're unclean, Peter. Well, Peter, no, oh, the Lord told me nothing's unclean. The Jews are not, and the Gentiles are not unclean. We can, we can have fellowship with them. Oh, no, no. The idea that the Jews had, and they were told by God, don't associate with the, the Gentiles because they'll bring pagan religions into Judaism and ruin it. So there was a need for the Gentile, the Jewish people to segregate. But now that's over. The Lord has declared that nothing is unclean. It's time for Jews and Gentiles, for the whole world to unite in Christ. But the argument began when Peter preached to the Gentiles and James and Peter had the argument in Acts chapter 11. And then, again in Acts chapter 15, you had the Jerusalem Council, which is 20 years after Pentecost. So for 20 years, this has persisted. And then there's still the, the idea that you got to practice Judaism and it's generally just for Jews. Paul, let Paul go and talk to those Gentiles. Let's, yeah, he's the apostle to the Gentiles. Good, good riddance. Go, Paul. You spend all your time with the Gentiles. We're not going to waste our time with them. We're focusing on Jew, the Jews. We have the gospel of the circumcision. Paul, you can have the uncircumcised. And uh, so that was the attitude. And uh, so these people here, Paul is referring to them again. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. So some people are trying to impress the Jews, the Jewish believers, 
and, to, 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 and they're saying, yeah, everybody, you, you know that you must be circumcised. You can't be saved unless you're circumcised. Only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross. Uh, I want to see the end of verse 12 and amplify. Just so they will escape being persecuted for faithfulness to the cross. So if you're faithful to the cross, if you're faithfully saying salvation is a free gift by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, no circumcision is, is required. No dietary laws are required. Uh, no uh, uh, Sabbath is required. No temple worship is required. No animal sacrifices are required. Judaism is not required in any way. In fact, if you want to practice Judaism, you better put no faith in it. Because if you divide your faith between Judaism and Jesus, then you're lost. Christ has become of none effect to you. That's what's going on here. And so these people, they're being persecuted by the Jews, the Jewish believers. And then this leads us right here in the end of Galatians. It should lead us right into the book of Hebrews because they're all, in the book of Hebrews, uh, the, the historical setting is you have um, some Jewish believers who are being persecuted because they're not worshiping at the temple, they're not doing the animal sacrifices, they believe the gospel, they believe in faith alone in Christ alone, but they're being persecuted, they're being shunned by their families, the community, and unfolding under the pressure of the persecution, they're starting to go back and, and do the animal sacrifices. And, and the book of Hebrews is saying, what in the world is wrong with you? You're, you're folding under the pressure because you're being persecuted. You're doing things that don't make any sense. You know that Christ died for all of our sins, that uh, he was one sacrifice for all time. And if you believe that more sacrifices are needed other than Christ, the animal sacrifices, if you believe there's any value in that, then that's a false gospel. So that's why I think that Galatians and Hebrews are companion books. They're really making the same point. Uh, Galatians focuses a lot on circumcision. Hebrews focuses on the part of Judaism, which is the temple worship and the animal sacrifices. But the argument is still the same thing. Stop practicing Judaism. It's over with, it served, it had a purpose, it no longer applies not only to the Jews. Jews need to drop it. You need to leave it behind. Discard it. Put no faith in it. And Gentiles don't embrace it thinking you have to become a Jew and practice Judaism. But it says here, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. 